everybody has been extremely positive here, so let me be, let me be a bit contrarian. Um, I would argue that if you want to have a good career, try to attend university as little as you can and try not to join the EU after university. Let me, let me elaborate a bit on these, on these two points. Um, when I, I'm a lawyer. When I went to law school, I failed most of my EU law exams. Obviously, things have improved since then. In my time, people, ha teachers had, teachers teaching EU law have never actually worked in the EU. Um, <clears throat> so I was relatively skeptical about uh, learning from people who have never really done the job, which doesn't mean you can't learn from them. I, it was just probably my contrarian nature that was relatively skeptical on this. Um, so I spent most of my time outside of the university, starting up a company, working in a law firm uh, that served me very, very well afterwards. Um, when when people are looking at your at your at your degrees and at your CVs, at least what I see is obviously they're looking for a good university. UCL will will serve you very well because. There are a few HR departments that will sort out only a certain number of, of universities will only, will only look at those ones. It depends on the industry, obviously. I think UCL is a very good name to have in your, in your CV, uh, but that's where it stops. Afterwards, they'll be looking at uh, all the other kind of experiences that you have. So my suggestion would be try to get through UCL with as little work as you can and start up a company, um, work, work in a company, uh, or if you if you can't get away from from university, at least do something that you can put separately in your CV. Um, help out with the website, uh, do social media, do blogging, publish articles as much as you can. Everything. Uh, get active in in the student society. Write a newspaper. Edit a newspaper. You name it. Doesn't really matter what you do, as long as you as you pick up skills and practical skills that people can use. Um, if you if you can build a website, you will have a much better chance of being hired to a think tank or to a company than if you can't, for example, just, just a very basic skill. Um, one of the best things that I got out of university was the network. Uh, if you, we look at the statistics of the concours, we see that for 85 uh, staff, 14% of successful concours candidates come from UK universities, and for 87, more than 20% of successful candidates come from, from British universities. So the network that you pick up here will serve you very, very well afterwards when you're looking for a job. Um, do work consciously on your network and on your contacts. And don't join the EU when you finish university. Um, the EU is uh, let's not say the EU, Brussels, and the EU institutions are full of people who have never worked elsewhere, who have joined the institutions of the university, and are very good at procedures, very good in, in, uh, in shepherding through a piece of legislation, but know very little on the substance of what actually goes into that legislation. Uh, so if I were you, I would get a job in, 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 in the economy, in real life, in an NGO, you name it, at university even, that is real life as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and join the EU afterwards. I think it is a big mistake by the institutions that they are hiring people at low level. They're, most of the, the new hirees, especially from the new member states with CDs, are at 85 level. Instead of hiring people with 10, 15 years of experience in different sectors who actually know the business that they are afterwards supposed to regulate and write, regulation on. Obviously, there are exceptions, but if, if I look at the old, the old cohort of Eurocrats and the Commission, we see people who have had experience outside the institutions. And if I look at the new intake for the last 10 years, I see people joining straight off the university, and you, they know nothing else but the EU bubble, which is very interesting and very good, and I would urge you to get a job in the EU, but not immediately but after having had a career in, well, let's not call it real life, let's call it in business. Um, my experience in, in hiring people, both when I was uh, at, at the EU institutions and we were looking for trainees, 
who are now at the BBA is that there are usually hundreds of CVs you have to go through. When I, were look I was looking for trainees, I had to look at a few thousand CVs uh, that all came in, came in a zip file. Uh, when we now hired a new EU advisor at a, as a starting position at the BBA, we, get, we got 200 plus CVs. So when you're submitting your CV, I think that is the very best advice I can, I can give. Is think of the fact that the person who's going to look at it, whether it's for a traineeship, whether it's for a job, will have to go through a few hundred of them. So what is it that will, will stand out in your, in your CV that will make it special, that will make it different? Thank you. I was going to ask our contrarian contributor here um, to just elaborate a little bit on um, what you did before you joined the BBA and then how you moved on to the BBA because I think it, um, it'll be quite interesting for people to hear. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, I studied law. I practiced uh, law for three years in, in Hungary. Uh, I did mostly litigation, civil law litigation. <coughs> Before finishing university, I took three years off. I spent two years working on ships. That's on, on, on in the Caribbean mostly. That's what taught me probably the most about, about life and people. Um, I spent six years in Israel, and uh, six months in Israel, sorry, and six months in Bosnia, um, building the first elections back in 98 uh, for OSCE. That was rather interesting, as, as a, still as a student your age. Then finally, after eight and a half years, nine years, I finished university. It was supposed to last only five. Uh, I became a lawyer. I practiced law for, for three years. Then by chance, I w went to sit for the concours, but then I prepared obviously hard for it. You can't pass without preparing. Um, I succeeded. I moved to Brussels in 2005, and I worked at the communication director general as a civil servant with British, German, and Hungarian MEPs. I started with Hungarians, but then nobody wanted to work with, with, um, with some of the UKIP members. So then I started working with some of the UKIP members. I found them very interesting and very engaging. Um, actually, it was a very, very interesting experience for a young Hungarian lawyer. Uh, and then I worked with other uh, British members and German members as well. Then I became the spokesperson for the presidency, the Hungarian presidency in the council. So I spent one year at the council. It was, it was at a time when parliament and council had very little uh, institutional relations yet. And I was probably the first person who was ever, ever seconded from the parliament to the council. So it was a totally new word. Even today, there are very few people who have done parliament and council. Normally you move commission parliament or commission council, if you move at all. Um, having finished that, I came to the UK and became head of public affairs, outreach and social media for the European Parliament Office here in the UK, leading a small team on, on all these issues. And last year, I decided to, to take leave and I went to work in the city with the British Bankers Association, where I'm leading on their engagement on all financial files from too big to fail, bank resolution, financial markets, and so on, which is, which is pretty interesting and is good to, to do policy work again after having done communication for, for so long. Thank you, Gagic. Next round of questions. Are there any opportunities uh, regarding people that hold, for example, a dual citizenship of a non-EU country and EU country to maybe work in the field of non-EU and EU relations, maybe? Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. So, would your question be called? General question, I'd say maybe if anybody knows. Um, John, would you like? Um, yeah, I'm not really sure if I've understood, but uh, do you have EU nationality? Yeah, well, so yeah, for all EU posts, you have to have um, EU nationality, but obviously the EU deals with all kinds of, you know, deals with all uh, with agreements with, with countries from all over the world. So, you know, you do have departments that are dealing on uh, external relations, that are dealing with Russia or with Asia or Latin America. So there are opportunities there, yes. Did that answer your question? If I understand well, those who are not EU citizens, I don't know if there's anyone here who doesn't hold an EU citizenship, 
So for those, as far as I understand, you can still do traineeships. Yeah. You can still apply for traineeships, so don't, don't hesitate to apply for traineeships, especially if you know languages that you think are in high demand, uh, because are not that commonly known languages. And you can also do still, still do traineeships and even work for MEPs, if I understand well. I've saw people of US nationality only working with, with MEPs in the European Parliament. So that remains an option. It's just that the, the route for civil service is the one that is, that is closed for you if you don't have any EU citizenship. So from experience, I know that certain DGs in the Commission are also blocked depending on which nationality you are. So you may be able to apply for the internship with the Commission, but not in all, in all services. I have a question on lobbying. Um, how would you say you feel that you actually impact what happens at the European Parliament or the European Commission compared to when you are actually working for the Commission? I never worked for the Commission. I worked for the Parliament and the Council. Um, <coughs> I think it's m not really impacting what's happening. It's more showing what you think is the practice, the practical reality. Like there is a piece of legislation going through regulating an industry, uh, let's say how to resolve failing banks. And then the banks would like to be there and would like to explain how actually it is done, how they're doing it, and try to pinpoint those practical problems where even the the best best intentions can produce negative results. Uh, I give you a very simple example. Um, look at anti-money laundering, which is extremely important. Um, <clears throat> we see as a result of 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 uh, of the focus on anti-money laundering, which should remain and which is important, that. Certain countries, for example, get almost cut off from, from, um, from banking services and from certain countries, especially developing countries, you cannot access Western financial services because banks don't take the risk of accepting that. You cannot transfer aid money, for example, to Syria or you have serious difficulties transferring aid money to Syria because how can a bank guarantee that that money that is being transferred by an NGO is not going to end up in the hands of someone it's not supposed to end up in? And then you will get fined in the billions even. So there's this kind of risk aversion that can develop uh, on the basis of anti-money laundering rules that are very important. And we are there to pinpoint this together, for example, with an NGO saying, we have this client, the NGO has these problems, they can't get the money to Syria. What can we do about that? This is how I see lobbying. It's instead of trying to influence decisions uh, from a political perspective, it's trying to look at the substance, what is written down, on how this is going to function, and trying to pinpoint those, those, those things that are not going to function or that are undermining in, in other pieces of legislation, the aim of this legislation, which is written by a different unit and the two units don't talk to each other. So that's kind of how I see the role of the lobbyists to bring, bring the practice into, into the European decision making. And this is why I made the point that it's so important to have practitioners actually writing that legislation.